then something happened. I don't know whether you've heard about it. It was a dramatic thing to happen, but it happened very quietly. They suddenly found that these savanna sites where the human fossils had been found were not savanna at the time when the hominids were living there. There weren't trees there. They had a new technique for examining fossilized pollen. They could put it under a microscope and they could find out what kind of plants that pollen would have evolved into. And it was not savanna pollen, it was woodland pollen. Some of it was even pollen from lianas, those great things you only get in the thick jungle. <coughs> so what were they going to do about that? The most highly praised and valued scientist in South Africa was Philip Tobias. He was the man who named Homo habilis. He was th at the top of his profession. He'd been a paleontologist for years. When he heard about this, he came here to University College London. He was invited to come to deliver the Dario Ford Memorial Lecture. And he came and said, I have believed in the Savannah theory all my life, and I've come here to tell you that you were wrong. We were wrong all the way along. We've got to go back to square one. We've got to think about it all over again, because all that was wrong. Now, this time, there was no reporter there in the back row, and nobody said headlines all over the Sunday papers. South African professor says man is the ape. It was all kept very low key. He was enthusiastic about it. He said, you know, this is exciting. We have found something different. Now we've got to think it all out again. And this is a marvelous opportunity. But he was not treated as if it was a marvelous opportunity. He was treated as if it had been very tactless and bad manners of him to come and tell them that they'd all been wrong. Almost none of it got into the papers. Is it? because he was wrong. No. If you read very carefully, there was a little bit in nature. The savanna hypothesis of human origins, in which the cooling system begat the savanna and the savanna begat humanity, is now discredited. There was one little bit in the Journal of Human Evolution. Recent evidence suggests that the common supposition that australopithecines were grassland adapted is incorrect. So they didn't say he was wrong. They knew he was right. But they just, it was the same as they said about Darwin. They said, well, if it's true, let us at least hope that nobody finds out about it. And they seem to take the same attitude to, um, to Tobias. They carry on as if nothing had happened. They don't tell you, well, we're now at a loss, we've got no reason at all to explain why humans are different. They carry on as if nothing had happened. Why do they do that? This is what they always do. If you read a book, quite a famous book at the time, by a philosopher called Thomas Kuhn, he was talking about the structure of scientific revolutions. And he said this, that people get the idea that science is created by people assembling facts and confirming them and knowing that's safe to build on. And every scientist comes along, puts another little brick on that structure, and it grows higher and higher, and it's absolutely solid. And he said, but that is not how some of the great advances take place. From time to time, somebody comes along and says, I'm not going to put a brick on top of that pile, but I'm worried about this brick halfway down, and I want to take that brick out. That's, in effect, what Tobias was doing. The brick was the savannah there, and he wanted to take it out. And of course, that causes immediate consternation, because nobody knows 
how much of the superstructure is going to collapse if you take out that one brick. So, on the whole, they tend to go on, if somebody does that, ignore it and pretend it hasn't happened. And that is the position in which science of, of evolution is being carried on today. They know the Savannah theory was wrong, but they go on using the same language. And Thomas Kuhn says that is what they do. If, the, if, the, if a paradigm collapses, they've got to go on using it because you can't ask questions unless you've got some framework. So they carry on with it. And in fact, some people have got to the point of saying, quite frankly, perhaps we need to stop worrying about selective pressures. We must stop asking that Darwinian question about what changed them, what the habitat was, because we can't answer it. So we'll just concentrate on something else. Now this was the opposite of what Darwin believed. He called this hypothesis free science. And he was he had complete contempt for it. Because in those days they there were a lot of people doing hypothesis free geology. They were picking up pebbles and different rocks and stones and assembling them and said we'll we classify them and we'll give them all names and numbers, but we won't ask why they are there and why there is chalk on, on top of a mountain. Um, and he said, th there's no point in this kind of science at all. You've got to ask why. But at present moment, the powers of be have stopped asking why. And they're quite open about it. Now, what Thomas Kuhn said was, they carry on with the old paradigm until a better one comes into sight, until they've got an alternative. The curious thing now is that there is an alternative there. There's a perfectly good alternative in aquatic theory, but they're not willing to look at it. There are two reasons why it's particularly hard for them to accept it at the present time. For one thing, if you look at some previous scientific revolutions which did work, it usually meant that some new discovery had been made. For instance, there was the, the change when people started believing in continental drift. Wegener had been saying, again, for about 30 years, I think the continents move because look, if you look at the bottom of that continent, the bottom of that continent, they've got the same kind of rock structure, they've the same similar animals, similar plants. And however many data he gave them, they said, no, we can't look at it because continents don't move. Then they suddenly found a mechanism by which continents can move, and it was all right, he became a hero. Another change was, when I started writing in 1972, everybody said that Humans split from chimpanzees 20 million years ago. It must have been a long time because look how different we are. It must have taken at least 20 million years for all these changes to take place. And then the geneticists came up and said, no, it was nearer six million years ago. And on the whole, fairly quickly, that paradigm was changed because they had something new had suddenly happened. In the case of the present paradigm shift, it isn't that something new has suddenly happened. What has happened is that very slowly evidence in favor of the aquatic theory has been accumulating, and very slowly all the reasons for believing in the Savannah theory have been withering away. But it's happened so slowly that they never felt, well, now is the time we've got to do something about it.